Hi, Grandma here and I'm reading uh, By the Great Horn Spoon. One of the things that we haven't talked about is what exactly a horn spoon is. Um, here is a picture of one on my computer and you can see it's basically a spoon. Looks a little bit like a an ice cream spade, but it's, it has a bowl on it and it is made from a horn. Um, the ones that they sell today are made from water buffaloes. Um, I don't know what the horn was that they made, but why is it so important? Well, I had looked that up too. Well, it's a spoon that could be used for eating, but it could also could be used for <laughs> scooping out sand or uh, mud, but it also was useful as for this, this uh, fine powder that they get that's gold powder for uh, Put, putting it in there so they could see how much gold powder they had. Um, so it's a little bit like a spade, uh, a little bit like a spoon, but it's made out of horn. Okay, so today we're going to be reading chapter 12, which is called Bull Whip. And there's the picture, and I can't tell. Is that Jack and Praiseworthy walking with their boots in hand? That's what it looks like. Campfires along the river lit their way back to town. Carrying their shoes, the two partners were stuffed full of sow belly and beans, and between them they were richer by a thimble full of gold. Jack's feet ached from hours in the ice-cold mountain stream, but he was too elated to care. His face was dirty, and his clothes were dirtier. Praiseworthy's white shirt was splattered with mud. His umbrella was in tatters. First thing tomorrow, said the butler, we'll purchase boots. If we had a tent like Pitch Pine Billy, Jack said, we wouldn't have to sleep in that old hotel. We could stay right on our claim. Uh, we don't have a claim, but we'll get one, won't we? Oh, absolutely. And a tent? Why not? And a mule? He said we need a mule or a burro to go prospecting. A mountain canary for sure, said Praiseworthy. Jack tried to keep in step with his partner's long stride. Pitch Pine Billy thinks you're my father. I heard him. I don't mind. Praiseworthy pulled at his ear. When he gets an idea fixed in his head, he refuses to have it removed. I tried often enough, but he meant no offense. <clears throat> None at all, said Jack, looking up. He liked Praiseworthy. He liked him especially as they swung along together, both barefoot one as mud splattered as the other. Partners were the next best thing to being related, he thought. Better, maybe. A partner didn't take a hairbrush to you even when you needed it, but there were times when he wished he had a father, hairbrush and all. They walked along and from somewhere in the trees and shadows they could hear the wheeze of a miner's concertina. It's a little bit like an accordion, but smaller. For days since the discovery of Aunt Arabella's picture in Praiseworthy's carpet bag, Jack had wondered about it. The moment had never seemed right to ask, but now the questions just tumbled out. Does Aunt Arabella know you got her picture along? Praiseworthy shifted the pic to his other shoulder. Yes, yes, the picture, he said quietly. I've been meaning to give it to you. I've no right to it, no right at all. It's only a picture. You keep it. Jack shifted the shovel to his other shoulder. Why doesn't Aunt Arabella have a husband? What? I mean, she's beautiful, isn't she? Praiseworthy seemed positively embarrassed. Now see here, Master Jack, uh, Jamoka Jack. Constance says Aunt Arabella was in love once, but he died. And women like that never get over it. They just get to be old maids. Miss Constance should be spanked, Praiseworthy replied shortly, and then he changed the subject. First thing in the morning, I must see about getting my gold pan mended. I'll bet Aunt Arabella would marry you if you asked. Praiseworthy stopped as if struck. Then he began to laugh. Now that is nonsense, Master Jack. Stuff and nonsense. A woman like Miss Arabella marries a gentleman, not a butler. It is, simply isn't done. I wouldn't permit such a thing, not for a moment. 
why your dear aunt would be laughed out of Boston. Now, let's hear no more of these fancies of yours. Come along. They resumed their stride, and Jack said no more, but Praiseworthy wasn't fooling him. No, sir. Praiseworthy had carried off Aunt Arabella's picture. He would never do a thing like that. No, sir. Not Praiseworthy. Aunt Arabella had given him the picture, Jack thought. Yes, sir. And the more he thought about it, the more it pleased him. Soon the coal oil lights of Hangtown could be seen through the trees. Praiseworthy stopped to put on his shoes, but Jack just carried his. As they came along the street, the men who sat and whittled stopped whittling. The standing, standing and talking men stopped talking. And the coming and going men stopped coming and going. Jack had a sudden feeling that everyone was staring at them. What was wrong? Didn't they have their heads on straight? And then a voice said, there he is. That's him, all right. Praiseworthy and Jack kept walking. They passed the SA office and the cheap John auction store and the general merchandise. A cold feeling was creeping along Jack's neck. Maybe they're looking for somebody to hang, he whispered. Unlikely at this time of the night, said Praiseworthy, but he was concerned. The men seemed to be smiling, and in Hangtown, that might be a bad sign. When they reached the Empire Hotel, the porch loungers gazed at them in a kind of awe. A mutter of voices arose. Knock that outlaw 17 feet uphill. 19 feet, the way it was told to me. 19 feet and 11 inches, they measured it. Praiseworthy stopped in the doorway. He looked at Jack, who broke into a muddy smile as if they had been saved from the limb of a tree. And then the butler turned, peering at the whiskered faces, grinning in the yellow light from the hotel. A miner shifted the lump of chewing tobacco in his mouth and said, Stranger, you must have a fighting arm like the butt end of a bullwhip. Pleased to have you in our town. Pleased to be here, Praiseworthy said, lowering the pick from his shoulder, but not under false colors. Gentlemen, allow me to be explain. Hey, bullwhip, where are you and that young'un from? Boston, sir, gentlemen, our good friend and travel companion, Mr. Jonas T. Fletcher, appears to have spread a grossly exaggerated account of what happened. You see, hold on, you calling him a liar? No, but, well, did you knock that road agent uphill or not? Yes, but the miners began to chuckle and chewing tobacco went squirting in all directions. They had taken an immediate fancy to Praiseworthy, and one by one, they picked up the nickname. How long you staying, bullwhip? Praiseworthy shouldered the pick. He gave up trying to explain. It seemed to him that every man in the diggings became hard of hearing when he wanted to, and he'd had enough of that for one day. If they preferred a tall tale to the facts, let them have it. Bullwhip, you were there. Exactly how far was it? Praiseworthy gave Jack a passing wink. As long as the citizens of Hangtown were determined to hang a reputation on him, it might as well be the best. Gents, he said, from where I was standing, it looked 23 feet at best, at least. A miner swallowed his cut of tobacco. Oh, be joyful, he uttered. Come along, Jamoka Jack, said Praiseworthy, turning into the hotel. Jack felt a brand new smile reach across his face. Yes, sir, bullwhip, he said. So they both, in the first day there, got new names. Bullwhip and Jamoka Jack. Which one would you like to have, Jamoka Jack or bullwhip? Well, since my name is Jackie, I prefer Jamoka Jack. So the next time you see me, Say, hi, Jamoka Jack. Okay, bye-bye.